was out there in collaboration with the Arsenal and the Arsenal and the Arsenal and the Arsenal and the And then if you would, would you turn to a neighbor, introduce yourself, say your name and where you're from, maybe your role, and share your takeaway with your neighbor. Validation for sure. And I agree. I think Ecampus is doing an awesome job. Okay, so that works. 
Another takeaway. Yes, I, I, um, I think the takeaway I got from the game design class that made me realize is that our students, like our students maybe can be motivated if we can provide them with a way to have autonomy and that they can see um, why they're doing something and that they're making progress in that. Right. And that can actually motivate them. And so um, it highlights the places where what I'm doing is actually creating the kind of situation that I end up going to have for. So, and so it, it, so it then, it, it then sit, it makes me sit there and say, so how can I redesign the class so that I can give them the greater sense of autonomy, the greater the, the understanding that they're making progress slowly rather than being confused. So maybe we have some responsibility for our students' lack of engagement. And again, I think all we have to do with what you just described in terms of seeing the value and the relevance of the thing and seeing that we are making progress, we just think about ourselves. And that applies to ourselves as well, right? You never get a task at work that you're like, this is stupid, I'm just never going to come with it. You have no idea what sometimes. So, just, just, so I do think that helping our, um, putting ourselves in our students' shoes and experiencing <laughs> And then thinking carefully about the conditions that we create. There's a very new um, book, a recent book called The Missing Course that came out. And I really love this um, author's approach about we, we can't make anybody learn. We can't make anybody do the things. But what we can do is to create the conditions that, in which they can engage and learn. And I think what you just identified is sometimes unintentionally we create conditions that kind of hinder their learning. Yeah, that's great. One more, one more takeaway. I saw, I saw a movement. Oh. <laughs> That's scratching my forehead. <laughs> <laughs>
And I actually put this in the book and I changed it to my niece because I didn't want my daughter's high school English teacher to know. <laughs> <laughs> I had a conversation with my daughter about a year or so ago and she said, how long does it take you to grade a paper because I have an English teacher? And, and I said, well, it kind of depends, you know, the length, the, how much in depth. And I and finally I was like, she doesn't care. I was like, oh, about 20 minutes. And, um, and she's like, oh, wow. And I'm like, why do you ask? And she said, because I've never gotten an English paper back from my teacher ever. Wow. The whole year. They never got any grades or feedback. And um, it shocked me, just like it did all of you. Like, how is how's somebody going to know how, what they're supposed to be doing better? And I asked her that. How do you know what you should be doing better? And she's like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so just a good reminder that um, taking that time to help students know, and, and when we don't do that, or don't give timely feedback, or any feedback, um, that's really not serving our students well. OK, well, I could have this conversation for the whole hour, but I suspect this is probably not why you came. So, Let's um, jump in, because what I have here for you today is four categories of things that I think are pretty important and kind of unique for online classes. Again, not entirely, but kind of key issues for online classes. And then in each category, I have two specific practical strategies. If you're teaching online right now, you can use them today. Some of them you might want to plan and use for the next term or the next semester. But these are super duper straightforward, tiny little things that you can do that make an impact. So let's jump into that. Um, before we do, to yourself this time, not talking to a neighbor, one word that describes how you feel about online teaching. I don't have to prepare the way I really want to prepare. Okay, so uh, your word might be high uh, yeah. pressure, something like that? Yeah. That's fair, I get that. <laughs> but I, don't, I wasn't actually going to ask for, for um, me to call that out right now, just think about it. Still, I, I totally get that. Um, I, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm teaching right now. It's hard to find the time. Um, a couple of days ago before I came here, I was logging in at 4.30 in the morning, because that's the time that I have. So that's how we do. But keep your word in mind, OK? And again, if you were in my talk yesterday, uh, we did talk to a fair extent about the challenges about online teaching and learning, so I'm not really going to go into that, but I do think it's important to just acknowledge that it's not easy. It's, um, there are challenges, there are barriers for both faculty and for students. And so what we do know about online classes that we didn't talk about yesterday, we know that enrollments are increasing steadily over the last several years. They're up to about 6.3 million students out of the roughly 18 million students in higher ed these days. 6.3 million of them are enrolled in at least one online class. And as I mentioned yesterday, these enrollments are increasing. In-person enrollments are decreasing. We also know that they do improve access to education. It makes it more possible for people to attend school and get that college degree or, decre or credential. But I came across some interesting research that shows us that underprepared students struggle in online classes. And this is not really too surprising, right? We talked yesterday about our A student who has everything together. But um, students who are less prepared to be successful in academic classes, they're going to struggle even more. And then we also know from this research of about 17,000 students that if they have a poor experience, maybe they drop the class or they fail, get a D or an F, that they are uh, more likely to drop out of college altogether. And again, for me, this is just increased motivation to really sort of try to wrestle with this problem of how we do online teaching well, despite the challenges. So once again, just that guy, he's got it all together. He needs his executive <laughs> functioning skills. What I'm going to share with you today for part of the one of the categories is how we design for students who are not this guy, for students who need to develop some of those executive functioning skills. And um, there's a couple of very practical things that I'm going to share with you today that will help students develop those abilities. And then again, we ourselves, we know that um, some of us struggle with our online teaching as well, whether it's a time management issue, whether it's a, uh, we're not sure it's really effective. I've had so many conversations with faculty who tell me that their in-person students are learning better, like they're, they're getting a better educational experience than their online students. And that really grieves me that, that um, I just don't think we're, that's OK. So we know that we're still learning. We're still trying to figure it out. And sometimes we ourselves get a little frustrated. I had a good conversation with Chris. I don't see him in the room yet, I mean, today. But yesterday, he asked me in one session, he's like, but how do we feed our own souls? How do we kind of keep ourselves kind of motivated? And uh, I, I had a thought that I'll share with you toward the end if we have time. Um, There's one way that we can motivate ourselves. Did you have? Do you mind? Please. Okay. 
about the instructors who feel that they're on in campus, uh, in, in person classes, the students mm -hmm. are learning better than online. Is that just a, is that just a feeling or are there data to actually support that? Because mm -hmm. that's how students feel about lectures versus active learning. Right. So we know the data is saying just the opposite. Right? I don't know are those individual faculty that they compare their okay, yeah. outcomes, but I do know that that is not right as shown by the research. Oh, there was a meta-analysis in 2014 of hundreds of different studies of comparing online learning outcomes versus in-person. Mm -hmm. And in fact, online and blended learning outcomes. Well, blended is best, online is better, and in-person is what it is, which is not always perfect either. Mm -hmm. right. But I just hear from a lot of uh, faculty ex anecdotally or experientially that right. That they don't, and I think what it comes down to is they just don't know how to teach. You know, this one person I was thinking of was telling me kind of what he does, and I was like, yeah, that's not how I teach. <laughs> Which is, I mean, we're all learning. We're all trying to figure it out, you know. But um, I do think, again, that we, we understand there's a need here and a challenge. We spent a lot of time yesterday talking about why we think this is important, so this is just kind of a reminder that we do think it's important. It's, for me, it truly is a social justice issue. There's just no question in my mind that this work is really important, as I said ad nauseum yesterday. So, the question is how? How do we do it? And this is the goal of today. Yesterday I did deliberately try to paint a really big picture of, and, and pull at your heartstrings a little bit, because my heartstrings get pulled sometimes, and I think that's okay. But let's look at the practical strategies. And one of the reasons that I wanted to hear from you about your takeaways yesterday is what were some of the practical things that you heard about that helped motivate ourselves and help motivate our students. And I think we did hear about reminding ourselves that um, there might be things that we can do regarding the structure of the class that help our students be more successful. Um, there might be things that we need to get from our students to help motivate ourselves when we're kind of feeling the slump. Um, so I'm tempted to give you another minute right now with your partner to just sort of talk about some of the hows that you may have experienced or maybe that you do in your own classes. Would you like to do that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so share with each other, talk a little bit about some, some of the hows that, you're, that you've seen, that you've learned, that you're doing to improve the online class experience. And then as I did a minute ago, I'll ask for um, people to share with <laughs> Just a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs>
are we doing this? How are people that we are learning from doing this?
any informal conversations as if they were speaking to a clinician or a client or patient. And um, it's allowing them to be more connected to one another yes. as well as with their instructors. Exactly. Yeah. We have to help the so to create the conditions in which yeah. students can connect with each other meaningfully as well. And so I, I haven't used Flipgrid. I think it's a really interesting tool. I have, as you know, used video in my classes and sometimes video discussion posts. Similar, probably not quite as streamlined. And I have students in my classes saying, we've been in this program, we've got to have three different classes with that name, but now I see you and you're a person and I hear your voice. <laughs> so um, that video connection really is important. Um, and yet, one of my other big tenets is that for some people, video is a little too high tech. Maybe people who are newer to teaching online or if they're, they're not comfortable with it. And so a big component of it doesn't have to be video. There's lots of other lower tech things that we can do to help foster those connections. Just on that note of helping students connect with each other, I really like this idea that I came across recently called Study Buddies. You can just put students in groups of two or maybe three and encourage them in their groups just to exchange their text or their phone numbers, I should say, and then text with each other whenever they have questions. And what I like about that is that like I um, belabored yesterday, a lot of times students are doing their work by themselves, but maybe their study buddy is also doing their work at that time by themselves. And it's just a quick way to go, hey, could you? And again, I've actually seen this organically develop between my husband and um, a coworker friend of his who's in the same program, and they do that all the time. And that's when I was like, wow, we should like structure that. So <laughs> help students connect with each other, I think, is really important because then you can kind of crowdsource the support. Okay, well, I, I suppose we should probably get on to um, <laughs> some of the content for today. How many of you are familiar with the Community of Inquiry Framework? Okay, good. Um, I will go through it briefly here today for those of you who have not seen it. And I'm going to add an element that um, I've, I've kind of added because I think it infuses everything that we do. So the Community of Inquiry Framework is a really useful um, way to think about what we need to have effective online classes. This comes out of research conducted in the late 90s, um, and at that time it was called computer-mediated learning or something like that, but it's basically what are the elements that are needed in order to produce deep learning in the center, because that's really the gist of a lot of faculty and administrator complaints. There's a lot of skepticism about whether online classes work, whether students can really learn. So just very briefly, the Community of Inquiry Framework involves the three elements in the center here. The cognitive presence is the thought, the intellectual work that you have done in creating the course. For me, honestly, that feels a lot like the instructional design. What is the content? What are the learning activities? What are the assessments? What are the goals? All the, all the intellectual creation and, and choosing and um, organizing of what's in the class. The teaching presence also kind of makes sense to us, like we're like, well, yeah, I suppose we should teach. So that's involved <laughs> in online classes. How, how are we giving instructions and um, content to our students? Are we using written text lectures? Are we using video mini lectures? Are we, are we facilitating this, the discussion in the discussion board? How are we, are we giving good feedback that helps our students know what they can do better next time? That's the teaching. And it does need to happen. And the reason I belabor this point is I still think that many online classes are like electronic correspondence classes, where students are kind of working their way through and there's not a lot of active guidance and interaction. So let's not forget, we need to be teaching our students. But the piece I think that is the most um, unfamiliar for people who are beginning to teach online or haven't quite gotten it yet is this idea of the social presence. And we've been talking about that already throughout this conference about how we need to be people. We need to remember that they're people, and we need to just be a person. So, um, for example, when you're sending out that quick reminder about an assignment or an exam that's coming up, you can do it this way. There is an assignment due on Monday, make sure you get it in. Or you can say, hey, everybody, you're doing a really great job. Thank you so much. Don't forget there's this thing coming up. And, and you can be yourself in your class. You can bring your tone of voice even in your written comments. I, I agree. I love media comments. But even in the way you write what's in the class, you can be more of a person than um, what sometimes happens. Okay? So those three presences together, or those three elements working together combined to make the deep learning. But I've added this fourth element that um, kind of goes around everything, and that is the emotional presence. And I thought a lot about this based on a book called The Spark of Learning, Energizing the College Classroom with the Science of Emotion. And I love this book. 
because it acknowledges that we have emotions. The, the main argument, Sarah Rose Kavanaugh creates this argument that basically says traditionally in academia, we have wanted everything to be cold and rational and a lofty acquisition of knowledge. And she presents compelling research that shows that emotion and cognition are inextricably linked. You can't separate the emotion from the cognitive activity. And why don't we just acknowledge that? And then we can actually harness the power of emotion, much like I deliberately did yesterday, <laughs> to kind of, really, kind of really get people's attention and hold it and, and for our students, right? And get some kind of investment. So um, I believe that the emotional element of our interactions in online and in-person learning are really, um, really key. They really kind of combine everything together. How many of you are familiar with Universal Design for Learning? Okay. So um, I, I'm not going to go into this in depth, but it does need to inform everything that we do in, in all of our classes, really, but I think especially in online, again, given the challenges. And it's basically the idea that we want to make our materials accessible to all of our learners, and that um, when, when we make those supports available, they can help other people as well. And so it's a little bit of a cliche, but in case you haven't heard the analogy, Universal design for learning is born out of universal design kind of in the, in the physical world. You think about a curve cut, and that may have been put into the sidewalks to help people who were perhaps in a, real, a wheelchair, but it also helps who else? Who does that help? People with strollers? People on bikes? Yeah, rolling suitcases. I benefit from that. Um, scooters? Maybe to, maybe to the walkers, uh, the pedestrians' detriment, but. <laughs> Skateboards, you know, those, those benefit a lot of people in addition to the original population that these were implemented for. And we can do the same kinds of things in our class materials and activities. So, for example, if we have a, a text transcript, I hear a lot of pushback about captions, like captions, oh, it takes so long. Well, let's just say that you write your, um, your text transcript before you record your video. All you have to do is post that file, like in a PDF. And then, and here's one particular way that I've heard it being used, is maybe the first time students interact with that audio or video content, they do, they want to listen, they want to watch, but maybe when they need to go back and review some of the main points, they just want to skim through the written material. And so it's not about whether people have a disability or not, it's about the fact that all of our students are busy and bring their own unique needs and preferences and what can we do. And then Universal Design for Learning, when you flip it around, <coughs> and you think about allowing people to demonstrate their knowledge in multiple ways, um, that brings in some of the autonomy and the choice that is helpful for our students as well. So those two frameworks really kind of guide everything in the book and in today's um, presentation. And the, um, the focus here is, is that small changes can be really impactful. How many of you have heard of or know a little bit or have read Small Teaching? Okay, all right. So um, <clears throat> Jim Lang came up with this concept that uh, there are little things that we can do in our teaching that are not overwhelming that make a big difference in student learning. And um, he's basing it on a book called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning, which is a really interesting book for me because it's not just about academics. Mm -hmm. It's about what if you want to learn Italian or scuba diving or um, anything that you want to learn in your life. There are strategies that we can use to help that new learning stick. And, and be durable. And so the authors of that book have said in their book, um, much of what we've been doing with teaching and learning is not serving us well, but comparatively simple and small changes can make a big difference. And so that's the concept of small teaching, which is kind of the original book. And then I was able to partner with Jim, and we came up with small teaching online, which is how do you do these kind of small strategies that are based in neuroscience. That's really the, the gem of small teaching. It's like we're not just making it up. There is research that shows that this helps people learn, and so that's kind of um, the approach. So as I've been saying, lots of practical strategies that you can make next week. In order to qualify as a small teaching strategy, it has to take five minutes or less, so like brief interventions that you can do or make. It has to be strategic, especially with communication with students. You know, I think there are ways that we might be able to save ourselves time and still support all of our students in the way that we kind of want to, if we can be really strategic in our communication. And then they have to be doable, because if they're not, we won't do them. <laughs> 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 so 
So we want very, very practical, not overwhelming, not time burdensome, little things that we can do in our mm -hmm. online classes that will be, um, that are proven to have a big impact on students' engagement and their learning. We're going to start with backward design. How many of you could teach this section on backward design? <laughs> okay, but there's still a fair number of people who, who aren't super familiar with it, and so I want to share an, an analogy that has helped me in my work with our faculty. And that is to think about backward design in terms of a road journey. So let me think about this with you. Do you ever plan a road trip and not know where you're going? Yeah, some of you free spirits do. Okay, good. <laughs> Many people, I might even mention to say most of us, pick out a destination when we load up the car. <laughs> and we have an idea in mind of where we're going to get to. And that is what we do with our classes. Um, instructional designers like to call this setting your course learning objectives or your outcomes. But really what it is is what are the goals? What do you want your students to know by the end of the class? What do you want them to be able to do? Where do you want your students to get to? So we, we want to think about this sort of the destination that we're getting to. And then we want to think about the trip itself. But, but well, so example, how do we how do we know if we get there? You know, when you're driving, you're seeing mileposts, you're seeing signs that say, you know, that your destination is 236 miles further along this road, or um, you have maps that help you know that you're making progress in that direction. And then when you get there, you welcome to Disneyland, <laughs> whatever it is, there's, there's an indication that you got there. And so we think about this in terms of our assessments. What are we asking our students to do to demonstrate that they are learning and heading in the right direction toward that final destination? There are, um, when we get there, there are sort of big assessments like final exams or final projects, presentations. Along the way, there are little things like quizzes and written assignments and maybe some group tasks or discussion that happens that demonstrates to us that students are kind of heading the right direction. And then here again, sometimes we can identify that they're not, that maybe they're sort of veering off on a, on a you know, path that isn't where we want them to go, and that's when we need to sort of jump back in and say, okay, wait, let's, let's remember what we're doing here and where we're going, and give a little correction or course correction. And then again, we plan for the journey. So if we know that we're going to the beach, we bring our beach chairs and our umbrellas, if we know we're going to the mountains, we bring our trekking poles and our hiking boots. What is it that we need to bring in order to help the journey be successful? Regardless of, we're going, of where we're going, we might pack an ice chest and some basic snacks and beverages just to kind of you know, have on hand. And this is what we think about with the content of the class, the instructional materials, the learning activities. What is it that students need in order to be successful to help them make the progress? that gets them to where we want them to get them. So, backward design is cool, but a lot of students in online classes don't see it. And that's why the previous slide said to surface the backward design. How can we help students understand that what we're asking them to do is meaningful, is relevant, has a purpose, is not busy work? Because when we're in the classroom with them, we can kind of add all kinds of informal comments and guidance and explanation. It's hard to do that online. And in my experience, when you try to do more of that, it just becomes a lot of noise for online students. It's just, they stop reading, they stop watching the videos. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance with how much guidance you can, you can give them. But still, I've taught classes where the students had no idea that there was a major research paper in week 10, and it was like week nine, and they were like, whoa, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. And I'm not kidding, if Tim is still having that experience, my husband that I was talking about yesterday, he's still having that experience Right now, he ends a class today, and a week and a half ago, he's like, I don't know what the final project is. <laughs> Which, again, I don't think is really intentional. I just think that it's hard, because there's a lot of written stuff, and, it, and sometimes the material just isn't there. So this strategy that you might want to try engages students with the final thing that they're going to have to do right in week one. And that just sort of makes them look at it, read it, figure it out, understand what's coming to help them prepare for that journey. So for example, if you do have something like a final project or paper of some kind that will be due at the end of the class, one of my favorite strategies is to call or ask students to maybe make a concept map in week one about some of the ideas that they're thinking about and how they might develop that. Or maybe fill in sort of a table like 
here's, here's one thing that I could do, or here's another, and here's some pros and cons. We just get them sort of brainstorming and thinking about what they might do for that final activity right up front so there's no surprises later. If your class is one in which there are more exams and those kinds of things, maybe it's just giving them quiz questions that will be similar to what will be on the exam so that they can begin to get practice and get fluent with those kinds of questions. So just get students thinking about and working on that big final activity right in the first week. Another idea that you can do to help students see the intentional design of your class is to ask them to reflect on your learning objectives. How many of you think that your students know what your learning objectives are? <laughs> how many of you how many of you know what your learning objectives are and could tell me them right now? It's hard to keep track of those. A lot of times we write them and then we set them aside and we get on with, with the class. But Again, when we help students understand that there's a purpose and that this is what they're going to be able to do as a result, it does engage them, it does motivate them. So, one of the things that I've seen done is to ask students in week one as part of the orientation, kind of getting familiar with the class, read the course learning objectives, pick two and write about them or record a, a video or something about them. And you could structure that in any kind of way. You could say, which two look the scariest to you? Which two are the most interesting? Pick one interesting and one scary. What are you curious about? What, right? And just it kind of structure a way for students to interact with the learning objectives to help them pay attention to them. Because my students just skim right past them otherwise. I don't know about yours. And sometimes I skim right past them too. But I wrote them and I set them aside. But when we think, when we get our students to interact with and respond to and reflect on, it brings it back to us as well, kind of gets it back on our radar. And you can do this in the beginning of the class. I also like to do it periodically throughout the class. So whether it's every module or maybe at kind of quarter and half points throughout the semester, just ask students to go back, maybe look at your module learning objectives if you have those. What are we doing this week that really catches your attention that you think is going to be super valuable for you and your academic and career goals? Just get students working with those. Another way to do this is at the end of the module, now go back and look at the learning objectives and tell me what we did this week that helped you to get there. So any of those kinds of ways that you can get students reflecting on the objectives, it helps them see, again, what I really think of as the intentional design of the class and not that it's all just kind of, I don't know why I'm doing this, because that really does demotivate students if we're doing that. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the science of emotion as I mentioned earlier. Sarah Rose Kavanaugh is the author of this book, The Spark of Learning, and it's a great book. I love it. Um, but specifically for online classes, she reminds us that there are knowledge emotions involving, including um, attention, memory, and motivation. How many of you feel that your students don't always, aren't really attentive to what's happening in your online class? How many of you find that your students don't seem very motivated about what's happening in your online class? So there are ways that we can deliberately engage their um, emotional response to get their attention. And she, all you have to do is think about, as she reminds us, all you have to do is to think about where you were on 9-11. It's not hard to um, remember that, right? Because there's such a strong emotional response there. Now, ideally, we don't necessarily want to uh, provoke negative emotional responses <laughs> with our students. But every once in a while, maybe we do, with, with caution. Maybe, um, maybe we're studying you know, um, Middle Eastern strife, and maybe instead of reading a bunch of data about the interactions there, maybe we want to go ahead and post a picture of the refugee child with the really big eyes. Maybe we do. Maybe sometimes maybe we do want to post a picture of the destruction of a natural disaster or whatever it might be, and kind of deliberately and carefully harness our emotional responses. And I say carefully because emotions are tricky and they can backfire on you. Mm -hmm. So again, for me it's about intention. And there's a purpose for doing that. But it might be that you're going to go ahead and post a video, a moving song. There's all kinds of ways to kind of help people immerse themselves um, in what they're learning in a more sort of emotional kind of a way. So one thing, one strategy here is to bring your own passion to help to create the atmosphere of a thriving online community. So I think that if some of us have been teaching online for a long time, the same kind of content, maybe we've kind of lost our own spark. I don't know if that's happened to anybody else. <laughs> so we want to sort of remind ourselves why we think this is important. 
I taught, um, before I was in the ID role, I was teaching English full time, and I taught the same section of composition um, eight times, ten times a year. Yeah. Well, I taught a 442. Some of you resonate with that. I got so sick of bringing those research papers, and because they were bad. <laughs> Despite my best efforts. But what I did do is I, I sort of, I intentionally reminded myself, like, you know what? I do think it's important to be able to think and write and communicate well. That's going to serve people well in any kind of a job or lots of different ways. It's so important to write. And so kind of how do we find our own passion? Why is it important for us? And then the other thing that I got from this, uh, from Kavanaugh's book is the idea of emotional contagion. And that is that we infect each other with our own emotions. You think about any political rally or, um, you know, cheerleading opportunity or whatever it might be, people are skilled in kind of rousing the emotions of the crowd. And once, once something like that begins to happen, it spreads. And similarly, when there's something very sobering that, that we're doing or inviting people to consider, that also spreads. And so again, in our online classes, this happens, but it also happens in the physical classroom. Think about sometimes, for example, just as an example, I don't know if you did this, I, I taught on 9-11. And I didn't quite know what I should do. And looking back, I wish I hadn't. Because everybody was pretty sober, right? Or more recent tragedies um, that we hear about, they really impact the climate of the room. And we can kind of imagine that in an in-person <coughs> setting, but I guarantee you it happens online as well. I have taught students I've, where the group dynamic is so very different. Sometimes they're duds, sometimes they're super lively and really engaged. And um, I was in Jenny's session yesterday, and she was reminding us that we can create some of the enthusiasm and some of the momentum ourselves by the way that we interact with our students, by the way that we bring, show that passion, and kind of lead the way and deliberately work to infect our students with some enthusiasm and some motivation. So just thinking about the messages that we send and the ways that we're posting and interacting, how are we creating an atmosphere that is positive and supportive of learning and, and progress? And then, again, designing for emotion. So I was mentioning this just a few minutes ago. Maybe there is a really powerful video that kind of captures Maybe it's not the actual content. Maybe it helps students find another avenue into the concept. Maybe there's a song that you post, a recording with the lyrics. Maybe there is a very moving picture. Maybe there's um, a video clip from a movie. Um, maybe you're sharing your own kind of um, experience with a thing, with, with the content. I think really thinking carefully about how we design for emotion gets and holds students' attention. Here's a really fun way. This uh, friend that I mentioned earlier who I learned about the impact of using audio feedback, because for me, let me, let me just pause and say for me, it's important to remember that having fun is okay, and that humor is in kind of an emotion, and enjoyment is an emotion, and that's okay, and that's highly motivating. So in her class, um, which I'm so jealous, she teaches a lot of cool ones. One's on Doctor Who, one is on, um, I want to say comic books. I think it must be a comic book one. And these are sort of orientation, call it success kind of classes. And she has discussion posts in her class, discussion prompts that say, if you had a superpower, what would it be and why? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just fun. But then she able to skillfully use those responses to say, yes, and look, here's how we see this in Superman. I don't know. I haven't taken a class. But <laughs> what are some fun things that your students can do? What, how can we get them laughing? Because that will, that will engage them better and help them to be um, more persistent and, and make good progress. So just acknowledging that emotions exist in online classes as in everywhere else, and then thinking intentionally about how we can um, cultivate those things. I, Saw something recently that um, some faculty were asking students in their introduction discussion post to just you know post like a, a GIF of how they're feeling about the class, mm -hmm. or later in the semester like here's the assignment, here's the instruction, post a GIF, how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you know some of us skeptics kind of go, oh now that's not school, but <laughs> but just think about how we connect with people in online spaces using emoticons and GIFs mm -hmm. and means and all that kind of stuff. Let's take advantage of that. It's interesting, it's fun, it's motivating. It can, 
you know, you can have your student post the mind blown kind of, or the, or the double tear stream, you know? <laughs> Let's get them to um, kind of engage in those ways as well. Okay, so we've done backward design, or really in my mind it's intentional design and helping students see that. We've done uh, designing for emotion in order to get and hold their attention and keep them motivated. Now we're going to talk about designing for persistence. And this is what I was talking about, that a lot of our students don't have the necessary qualities and skills that help them to make consistent progress. But here's what we can do. We can give them activities and assignments that sort of force them into the behaviors that will help them be successful. And I have heard sometimes, you know, well, that's not the content of my class. I don't have time to do that. I'm encouraging us to think beyond the content and think about learning some life skills that will help our students be successful in all their classes, in their workplace, reaching their goals. I think these things can be well worth doing, and I do think it really does help students um, continue to make good progress. So the first one is to assign a goals contract. I love this idea. It's so cool. How many of you use something like a syllabus agreement? Or a syllabus contract? Syllabus quiz? Okay. Some of you have heard of that, and it's basically the idea that you ask students to read and agree to the terms of the syllabus, right? The conditions. Maybe you see it in a different form. Well, I like that idea, and I see a problem with it, which is that it's basically like every end user agreement ever. <laughs> They're going to click, 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 I agree, whatever, let me get on with it. So this goals contract combines the idea of a syllabus contract, in which maybe they do initial Maybe they do answer the quiz question, yes, I agree. But there's a second component to it, and this is what I think is really powerful. Ask students to identify two goals for their experience in the class that session. So it's kind of a two-part thing. Maybe there's a document that they literally have to print, initial, and then take a picture and upload. And then ask them to identify two goals, but also ask them to identify an action that they're going to take to help them reach those goals, a possible challenge that they anticipate that might hinder their process or their progress, and then one possible strategy to overcome that challenge. And so it's very simple. Maybe the student's goal is to um, log into class at least three days per week, one of the goals. Maybe the action is that I'm going to put it on my calendar and I'm going to go to the campus library so that I can just sit down and do that and not be quite as distracted. Those are, those are some good goals and actions to help students think about possible challenges. And I'll tell you why. Because it kind of acknowledges right up front that there's going to be challenges. And you're not going to ask them to identify all the possible challenges because they can't. Maybe five of the grandmas really are going to die this semester. <laughs> I've had students that seems to happen to a lot. You, know, you don't know, but we do know that something's going to come up that's going to get in their way of the progress, or the, in the way of their progress. And so, kind of getting students to think about, well, what could happen? A lot of my students think that their computers end up at the repair shop all the time. I'm like, seriously? Wow. Okay. And then, what are you going to do? What's your strategy if your laptop is in the tech shop? What are you going to do? So just getting them to think and articulate um, what are my goals, and it's not all my goals, just a couple. What is an action I, I commit to taking? What's a challenge that could come up, and what's a strategy? It gives them a habit of mind that helps them to think, okay, challenges are going to come up, and I can get past it. It's okay. Now, the cool thing about something like this, it can be a pass-fail. Turn it in, you get the points. Don't turn it in, you don't, as long as it looks like meaningful effort was made. It could be something that you set a conditional release where they can't proceed with the rest of the content until this thing is submitted. That doesn't take any time at all for you to bring. You just check it, you skim it, it takes less than 30 seconds. If they write something good. Okay? So, again, I'm all about things that don't burden us with grading, but help students develop um, meaningful skills and abilities. So, I love the goals contract. The second one I love. Also, actually, I thought it was a different one. <laughs> so, nudging selected students, I'm going to share three. I don't have a slide for my other one, but I'll share it really quick. Selected students is just the opportunity of, again, as I said earlier, being strategic in your communication and identifying students who might need a little extra support and just, I, you know, reaching out to them. So, I have a colleague at NAU on day three of her eight week accelerated biology class. She logs in to see who has not logged in yet, and then she sends a quick email to those people. It, it doesn't take a ton of time. 
Um, and then, of course, if you're strategic, you can copy and paste to make sure you change the student's name. <laughs> but you can sort of just nudge and say, hey, I, you know, I have noticed you haven't been in here yet. Let's, you don't want to lose any time. Let's get going. So, or after maybe a major exam, you reach out to students who got below 69 or whatever it might be. If you see a student who's kind of been inactive for a while, you reach out to that one. Just kind of being intentional to kind of give a little extra support and reminder. The one that I thought was coming up, I'm going to do really quick um, because I also love it. It's called the Structured Work Plan. And what this is, is before whatever that major thing is, if it's a research paper, a project, an experiential service learning activity, you ask students to identify a schedule for all the tasks that need to be done in that kind of bigger picture thing, when they're going to sit down and do that task, where, like literally, is it going to be at the coffee shop? Is it going to be at the library? Is it going to be on your couch watching Netflix? Um, maybe I have them identify what are the tools and resources that they need in order to be successful in that task in that day. And so I've seen it done kind of like a chart. You know, like here's in, in one column, here's all the steps that need to happen, and then here's the time I'm going to do it, the place I'm going to do it, the tools and activities. Um, it just kind of help them map out for themselves how they're going to pace themselves through the work. And again, this isn't something that really takes a lot of time to grade. Look and see if they did it and give them points for completing it. So I like that structured work plan too because it kind of nudges students into developing a plan that they might not otherwise. Okay. And then this last point is about making connections and specifically um, not necessarily with each other and with you, although we've been talking a lot about that, but it's about making cognitive connections between ideas and concepts. And I've learned a lot about this from my colleague, Michelle Miller at NAU. She's got a great book called Minds Online. If you haven't come across it yet, I would highly recommend it. It's super practical for online technology and how we help students learn in those environments. And she has this analogy that has helped me hugely. She argues that um, when we learn new material, especially if, we're, if it's not, if we're the novice, we don't have all the connections in our mind to make sense of everything. And she describes it like having a vast amount of, cl of closet space that you just throw everything into. There's no hangers, no rods, no shelves, no drawers, no shoe trees, no cubbies. You just put all your stuff on the floor in the closet. Imagine how long it would take you to get dressed every day. <laughs> You would be able to find the things that you wanted, but it would take a really long time. And so Michelle has, she's a cognitive psychologist, and she's really helped me think carefully about how do we help provide some of those structures for our students to hang new knowledge on so that they can go back and get it when they need it. And then how do we help them make connections for themselves and their neural networks, things that we already have in our brains as experts that our students do not. How do we help them create their own networks we can't create them for them? So these next two principles are really about the cognitive connections and the neuroscience to help students kind of get new concepts and hold on to them. One of them is to activate prior knowledge and experience, and this is exactly why I asked you at the beginning of the session today to think about one takeaway that you learned yesterday. So ask students, it can be a pre-assessment, and again, that could be a conditional release for um, before the rest of the content opens. It can be an ungraded pretest. What do you already know about this concept? It could be a discussion forum. Where have you seen this kind of thing in your life before? It could be um, just a, a, like a, res a reflection, like a journal. What do you know about this? Um, and again, it doesn't need to take a lot of grading time, especially if you take advantage of like a conditional release feature. So just get them thinking. It primes the pump for learning what you'll be giving them in the new module. And then the other idea here is to provide a framework. As I said, we all have the closet structure in our minds for our own discipline. We know how everything relates with each other, connects, informs all the processes, the consequences, the causations. We know all of that. Our students don't. We can do some very simple things, like, for example, asking them to print out the PowerPoint slides and take notes while they're watching your narrated Prezi or PowerPoint, and then take a picture of that and upload it so that we see their hand.